Good morning, everybody, and welcome to Filmscape. Um, we're here with uh, some amazing people who uh, put together the new Candyman movie. Uh, we'll let people keep joining in for the next couple minutes, and then we'll get started. Sweet. So I'll stay here, stare here, and look awkward, or we can chat. <laughs> <laughs> I hear about Jason's little one. Are you getting much sleep? Uh, yeah, I'm doing all right because we got two. So I'm on the older kid, and the wife takes care of the little one because there's not much. He doesn't really want much from me right now. So, yeah, no, I'm doing all right. Not uh, terrible. Axel's a good guy. Another boy. Another boy. Two boys. Mm -hmm. Your house is getting ready to get destroyed. <laughs> I'm thinking about doing like I saw the stunt man, and I'm just gonna just put padding on all the walls in the basement. <laughs> just do it, man. Get after it and just <clears throat> forget about it. How old's the oldest? Uh, two and a half. So yeah, you're gonna have nice to keep everything there. up, everything off the floor. Yeah. Oh yeah, we already did that. Yeah, so we're we're ready to go. <clears throat> I guess we can get started with the uh, introductions as more people keep uh, coming in. Um, so welcome again to Filmscape. Um, today we are here with the crew of Candyman to discuss uh, the amazing movie that we can't really discuss too much about. We can't give anything away with, but um, we'll show the trailer at one point um, to in case anybody hasn't seen it. Um, and we can kind of talk about anything with that and just the collaboration between these filmmakers. So I'm going to turn it over to Brad Wilson, who's moderating tonight. Yeah, thanks so much, Colette. And thank you to Filmscape for having us. So joining us today is director of photography, John Gulasarian. And John's claim to fame is he started as an ice cream truck driver before <laughs> studying cinematography at college. <laughs> First, he was an undergrad at Columbia College there in Chicago, and then went to grad school at AFI in Hollywood. His most recent films include Love, Simon, the just released An American Pickle, which is now streaming on HBO Max, highly recommend that, and of course, Candyman. I had the pleasure of meeting John about six years ago. He came into Kessler Camera for the first time to test some lenses for equals. Next up, we have Adae Shelby, the Gaffron Candyman. He just wrapped a night shoot at 7 a.m. this morning, so please forgive him if he dozes off. He's lived in many places, but was born and raised on the south side of Chicago. He recently gaffed the pilot episode for Lovecraft Country, The Red Line, and Captive State. Next up is Jason Bonner. He began loading back in the day and has worked his way up in the camera department. He was the ACAM first AC on Red Line with DP Kira Kelly, the Station 11 pilot with DP Christian Springer, Additional camera work on the series Empire and served as the first assistant cameraman on Candyman. And last but not least, we have Mike Fuchs, camera operator from New York, a big fan of Barista Edition Oatly. And he and John G have got along well on a collection of projects because of his great coffee accompaniment. So there you go. Oh yeah. <laughs> oh, and let me let me actually say something. I I worked on uh, Lovecraft Country, but I did not gaff that one. That was uh, that was actually really good guy named Christian Epps that did the Chicago portion of that. And I uh, just want to jump in real quick. Uh, any questions, please throw them in the Q&A and I'll be monitoring that. And towards the end of the discussion, we'll jump into this. So since the film hasn't been released, we can't say a whole lot about it. But before we play the trailer, John, do you mind giving us a rough premise of what we can or what you can say about the film? Uh, I mean, you know, it's a uh, it's Candyman. <laughs> the trailer speaks for itself. I mean, if you know Candyman, uh, you know what it is. And if you don't, you should watch the original Candyman and then get excited about this one. Perfect. Well, Colette, do you mind playing the trailer for us? Pretty creepy. So 
Candyman, you guys shot almost a year ago, or you started beginning filming almost a year ago. So how did you guys first meet? I mean, I think John and Mike, you guys had collaborated before, but Jason and Adae, did you guys all just meet on this project or talk to us a little bit about that? Uh, I'll start. I um, uh, I actually came on to this project a little bit late. Um, and, uh, you know, a lot of, uh, I had worked with Mike before. He was already like attached to do it, which was like a huge bonus for me. Um, and then, uh, and Adai and Jason were already on as well. Um, and, uh, you know, lucky for me, so. And Jason, have you worked with Adai before or is it first time for you guys two together? Or? Uh, yeah, no, we worked together for a few times. Uh, roommates at one point in time. Yeah, yeah. yeah very familiar. So John, before everything began, you started testing. You went to Kesslo Camera and you were testing cameras and lenses. Talk to us about that process and what you decided to end up shooting the film on. Uh, yeah, I mean, I had a feeling I wanted to use the LF because uh, I had just done American Pickle with the LF. And on that, we had used the, uh, the Airy DNA lenses, which were great for that movie because they have sort of a uh, softer vintagey feel to them. I think they're actually made out of old lens parts. Um, but for this, I really wanted, um, you know, there's a lot of artwork in the movie and there's like, I, I, I wanted like based on all of Nia's like references and whatever, I felt like that really needed to have some like interesting, like pure color to it. Um, and the signature primes, which were really like built for the for the LF, um, they you know, not to get too deep in the weeds technically, but they you know I had read a little bit about how the like with the new lens mount, like the lenses sit closer to the sensor and the light hits it at a ninety degree angle and you get this great color separation out of it. And so that's what I was looking at. I wanted to see you know, what that was. And I love the like large format being able to use wide lenses closer, which is something we did a lot in this movie. You can see it in the trailer. Um, and also like being able to control your depth of field so much with that, like with the pretty fast lenses as well for, for large format. So if you want a shallow depth of field when it's really, really wide, you can do that. And that was basically what I was looking at. But, you know, I came on with like four weeks of prep and uh, which is like not very much. Luckily, we have like the most prepared director in the world. So like it was a pleasure and like we just like hit the ground running and really just like, you know, worked our asses off for four weeks and you know, so, but I like the testing process for me was like, okay, like I gotta come in with like, you know, I'm, I, I, don't, I don't get that much time to do this, so like, you know, this needs to be something that is going to work for this movie and we're going to love it, you know, but I, I don't have that much time to test everything. So, yeah. you know, I went straight for those signature primes and then that's what we did. <laughs> and since we've got four of you from Gaffer to First AC Operator and DP, let's talk about the collaborative process. So let's talk about the prep and the pre-production. I'm guessing you and Adai were probably really deep in in uh, you know the pre-prep together, figuring out the lighting scheme and things like that. Talk to us about that process pre-production wise. Um, it actually, it went really well. Like um, I think from, like I was kind of amazed like from the very first conversation that we had about the, uh, about the movie that John had, that John had such a good idea of like what he wanted from it with that with a really short amount of prep time I had like a slew of questions and I was trying like I tried my best not to like just throw a bunch of stuff at him right away like like because I knew that he just got the project so I was like kind of trying to waiting like kind of trying to wait but I was like I have to change this entire truck if you say that you don't want certain things in which I actually did have to change a good amount of the stuff on my truck but like not like an excruciating thing like we didn't um i think we got rid of a lot of our hmis and we added like a lot of uh like 
we had a, a lot of bigger like LED items like uh like like some uh RGBW blanket lights stuff like that got rid of a lot of our uh bigger um bigger HMIs like uh, I think I had a couple Airy Maxes on there at some point like those got <laughs> thrown out uh a lot of our just a lot of our HMI package just got thrown out and we just kind of stayed in LED land and I was really amazed and like happy that John just came in immediately like looked at my list and it was like okay this is kind of what I want to do and like we, we both were like oh he was like I don't think we're going to need this ever I don't think we're going to need this and he was very like straightforward about a lot of the things that like he liked to like use like he didn't he wasn't like stringent on me about it, but like he was very straightforward about some of the things that he liked to use, which was, which made it so much easier. You make that sound so official, but we actually met at a bar and I remember- uh, I was trying not to say we met at a bar, dude, but, <laughs> but whatever. Yeah. And what about the process with Nia? It sounds like she came with her A game and had a lot of pre already done. Talk to us about her process and, and how that, started you guys off on a good start on a good footing and uh, for me i mean like nia is one of the best directors i have ever worked with at previs like and like in this case is so helpful because this wasn't a super long schedule and we did have a lot of um it also wasn't a like extremely long script i believe but um we, we had a lot of, you know, action sequences and, you know, things that needed to be storyboarded. And so she, you know, was very good at like the process of storyboarding and then going in and working with uh, animatic artists and then really like refining that stuff. Like, and at, like a lot of the process was like, we'd look at things, we'd give notes, and then the, it would come back with like, you know, like the shots would change. And by the time we were shooting a lot of these bigger sequences, we really had, you know, we had the full animation of it. Um, and, uh, uh, and so a lot, like for a lot of it, like, you know, we didn't even really need to do a blocking for everybody. Like we'd just show them this is what we're doing and we're gonna start with this shot and everything was scheduled down to like the shot, you know? Like we're gonna do this shot first and we'd look at it and we would, you know, figure out how to do it. And, you know, Mike is like one of the most detail oriented, like like camera operators, If I mean the most that I've ever worked with. And just like the, you know, that was, to me, like just a pleasure, like being able to, you know, to work in that way where we had these things that we had in, or Nia had envisioned, you know, happening and they're very like the effects heavy and very um, uh, like camera movement heavy and just, you know, the, uh, the execution of it from all of these guys was really special. So in the trailer, you can see, and I think, the first, I haven't seen the first movie. It's, I'm not a big horror fan. It creeps me out. But in the trailer, you can see a lot of mirrors. So the whole, I guess the concept is you say the Candyman's name five times into a mirror, and there's tons of mirrors throughout the trailer. So talk to us about how you worked around those mirrors. Maybe, Mike, did you have to contort your body while you were operating camera to make sure your reflection wasn't seen in camera? And talk to us about that. Uh, part of the, re uh, the prerequisite for this film was if you're going to be the operator for one of them, you had to be like very like you had, had to be able to hide behind poles and stuff. So like I shaved off as much, you know, body fat as I could, um, which is not, it's not hard for me to do. Uh, you, need and, a lot back since. you should have seen him. Yeah. Thank you. That's, I, that's good for self-esteem. Like tell me I'm, I'm uh, huge. That would be uh, that'd be great. If I better. Okay. So I, there's, well, there'll also be like a cut that I'll release. That's really just me and all the mirrors and stuff, but no, <laughs> I mean, it's just the beauty of technology and you know, there's only so much I can hide myself if, you know, if I'm in a steady cam or if we're moving a dolly around or, or whatever it is. So it's just nice to, um, you know, know uh, from the beginning that most of the time, you know, the certain shots, uh, we could just put the camera where we wanted to put it and then I would be erased later. And so that's more or less, you know, how I think the mirrors were treated. At times, if we could avoid, um, you know, camera and people around the camera, we certainly would. But, you know, when push came to shove and it was too tough, we just needed to put the camera where it went and then I would go away. But again, look out for that cut where I'm in all the shots. 
It'll be like 15 minutes. I give in the dailies as much as some of the actors, for sure. Yeah, which makes, but you know, which I'm super covered, covered in green material, but. Yeah, yeah, something like that. And uh, Jason, there was a lot of, I mean, very tight, tight spots and things like that. And so tell us where, you know, where were you able to position yourself to pull focus and, and also stay close to the, you know, the camera and things like that? Uh, well, when we weren't using the remote head, um, which we did a lot of the time to keep Mike out, um, True. as you see, I, I guess I can talk about it because there was a bath, the bathroom sequence there. So, uh, those bathroom stalls come in very handy. Uh, so the bathroom was, was my, my hiding spot in most cases, um, if not there in the art galleries. Uh, so now it's a fun time, fun time. But it sounds like Nia and the script supervisor were in the bathroom with you some of the times because that was the only space that they could really. Pay no, in. I mean, it was, you know, like in the art gallery, it was like the second floor of this very tight townhome walk up downtown, beautiful place, uh, gorgeous views. Uh, but it was like, you know, the director was like, you don't get the closest room, the closest spot. So I guess I'll be sharing that bathroom with you. Yeah. And, you know, that's what we did. And, uh, you know, it's it's all about like, you know, it's the collaborative and whatever it takes to make it work. And if we all have to squeeze into this bathroom, then so be it. So John had mentioned one of the reasons why I like the signature primes was the shallow depth of field. How was that pulling focus right next to the director with with those lenses? <laughs> uh, I mean, I guess, I guess, and you know, it, it's motivating. Motivating is what I would say that is, um, you know, uh, immediate feedback, immediate feedback. Uh, so yeah, just don't fuck up and, and it's a beautiful day. Uh, but at the same time, I don't know, it, it was great because I, I feel like, you know, as prepared as she was, she was still like a member, like she liked busting balls as much as she like loved telling you what to do. And so like there's, that, that made it that much more enjoyable. Yeah. So Adai, you, let's talk about going back to the mirrors. We had mentioned in our pre-discussion yesterday whether you had to hide the lights and things like that. But again, again, with all the reflection, talk to us about how you worked around with the mirrors and, and your lighting process in that regard. Yeah, for the vast majority of the movie, we ended up um, just using, like making fixtures that we controlled to actually light the scene, like um, in the art gallery. Like we had, a, we had a lot of lights just like above, just kind of doing like a base ambience, but like the most, the thing that we used the most was like we motivated light from the uh, the light the red light sculpture that you kind of see in there, and there's a projector. Say what? The Aster Gate sculpture, right? Yeah. Yeah. And yes, and um, there's also like a uh, there was a projector playing a movie, and we like literally just said like. Uh, we were we we I think that me and John took exactly like ten seconds to saying like. Oh, how do we rep replicate like, like the projector? We were like, oh, let's just get an extra projector and light with an extra projector, and we ended up doing that for a lot of that scene, and that that ended up being a really, really, like it it looked fucking dope. Like actually, like having that extra projector was amazing. Yes, that's <laughs> number one. <laughs> one of many. Yeah. Uh, John, one of my favorite shots in the trailer. So the protagonist is holding up a photo, an old photo of like the original setting, and then it drops down the focus racks to the now, you know, whitely, you know, nicely white painted church. So talk to us about you tried to pay homage to the original film and shot in some of the same locations. It, like was was this background of this Cabrini green? Was it sort of like part of the movie? Uh, like a character in the film, would you would you say? Oh yeah, I mean it's you know the 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 cool thing about this movie was that like you know we actually shot in Chicago, we actually shot in Cabrini Green, like what's left of Cabrini Green, um, and uh, you know and that's uh, that's that's what Candyman's all about. It has to be Cabrini Green, you know. Yeah. But could you, I couldn't imagine you know doing it any other way it's uh and I, I i'm sure that you know there were discussions of shooting it in cape town and stuff like that like and yeah you know, like but they they made the right choice like it's it, it's uh 
<clears throat> it's we're, we're really there, you know, and that church that you're talking about, that was actually day one of the movie, I believe. Um, that's, uh, that's the, you know, that's the church that was in Cabrini Green and we, you know, we used it. Uh, you can see some shots in the trailer as well inside. We shot inside that church as well. They had to really clean it up so that we could shoot in there. But like everybody was really on board with like, uh, you know, let's shoot in this real place. Um, and that's a real picture, you know, of, of the church. So. Yeah. <laughs> and you had mentioned the art department went and restored some of those old row houses so that you can get back in there. Talk to us about how it was going in there and, and feeling like it was 1992 again. Well, I mean, scouting in there was, uh, um, was crazy. I mean, just like scout, like, you know, the, it's all boarded up and, and fenced off now. And, um, uh, you know, and we just sort of would randomly be like, well, this looks like one that we might want to use. Let's open it up and see what's in there. Yeah. <laughs> like, and then, uh, you know, and then we picked a few places and um, they uh, restored it, not to 1992, but 1978, I believe. Uh, I'm, yeah. Uh, um, and, uh, yeah, I mean, it was it was interesting. It was really like we shot in actual Cabrini for a while, and it was uh, um, it was I don't know what was your experience there. I mean, I I lived in we've all lived in Chicago. Like Mike lived in Chicago. I lived there for a while. I was there when Cabrini was actually there. You know, you guys still live there. I mean, what how do you guys feel about <laughs> what it felt like to actually? It was. It was kind of, it was, it was definitely surreal actually shooting in Cabrini. Like, I have all sorts of feelings about that that I'm not going to go into. But, like, um, one thing that was really, really awesome about it, like, actually, like, shooting on location is actually kind of getting inspired by the location. I think that uh, one of the location scouts, we were looking, well, like, we were walking around the row houses, and we looked, all of the, uh, all the street lights were still on. And like some of the uh, fixtures are still kind of burning. And we kind of looked, I think me and John both kind of had that moment of like, oh shit, I think that we see our, we see our, see our color scheme. Like we looked at all the street lights still on and we like kind of looked over at like some, like there still are people that live in Cabrini Green. And we saw like how it actually just looks. And we started like installing some of the fixtures to make it make the actual like make it just look like Cabrini Green, like how it actually looked. And at first we're like, oh yeah, like like I was kind of like, oh well, well, this shit would just be turned off right now because like it's abandoned. And we looked over and was like, that that shit is not a, not turned on. Like a lot of plate, like a lot of parts of Cabrini, like the uh, like all the fucking street lights are still on. Like a lot of the um, yeah, that's two. And like a lot of the, a lot of the fixtures are still there burning. Like we're like, well, I guess we can get away with just installing it and kind of going with it for our actual thing. So it, like actually scouting it and actually shooting there like helped so much. I don't think that we would have came up with the same idea if we didn't actually go there and look at it. So we got a, our first question from the audience. Carolyn Betts is asking, or she says, based on the trailer, it looks like there are some visual callbacks to the original film, like the bloody bathroom scene. Can you talk about how you used or were inspired by the original film? Uh, so the I, in the production office while we were working, like I just remember the you know there were like TVs around and they just played the original movie on a loop. I mean, I watched it several times while we were prepping um, as well to just, you know, rem obviously to be inspired by it. And, you know, I mean, well, I don't want to, I, I, I don't want to say, yeah, it's definitely inspired by, in a lot of ways, um, locations and all kinds of stuff. I mean, and uh, like, but for the most part, it was like, what I liked about it is that when I'm, 
even just like was sitting at my desk, like doing my busy work, like prepping for this movie, like just, it was always on like right above me, just running on a loop and just letting it like sink in and, and be a huge inspiration. Um, you know, I, we didn't imitate it very often, but we were definitely inspired by it. So Mike, you <clears throat> mentioned that you use the remote head often. Talk to us about some of the shots that you use that you're allowed to talk about with the remote head and why why using the remote head as much as you'd mentioned that you had. Uh, yeah, I mean, sometimes just as, um, you know, to get me out of there and have less to paint out in some cases. Uh, we did a sequence that I think has changed a bit in the final film uh, that was just super tight, um, kind of going in one room into a hallway back into this bedroom and there was just no way to, you know, have an operator operating the camera and then execute the shot um, and have it probably look good because the contorting and stress that would have to happen for the operating to happen probably would have been a little too much. So it's always uh, just a combination of, you know, is it, is it easier to operate the shot? And it's always a luxury to have, you know, a remote head on call, which, which we did on this. Uh, it was a Moses and it's just lovely to be able to go to that tool, even on something where it's not a reflection thing where it's not even the, you know, the craziest shot to operate, but just to remove yourself as an operator sometimes. And, you know, let the, we had a lovely, amazing dolly grip, uh, John Hudasek, and just let him do the work and do the slow push and do the booming. And I don't have to be kind of rising with the camera or doing anything on I can just sit there and, you know, uh, pay attention to the tilt and the panning. That's what I'm there to do. I pan and tilt and I go home. That's what most people enjoy uh, when I just do that. And so that's, you know, when I can do that on the, on the remote head, usually, it's a nice thing, just takes the pressure off other things, uh, allows me to relax. I think the shot comes out better that way. Um, so I I was, yeah. oh, sorry, I, I, I just noticed too that like, it allows you to like concentrate on the shot like as a viewer as well, like rather than being like engaged in it and like not, not you know, and the, the, you're, like you're a perfectionist in general and like it just, it, I, I feel like it's the like, Watching you do that was always really special because I just I, I felt like the like the the you're you're removing the like physical aspect of it and really focusing on the technical aspect of it and that's really you know how it should be done I think totally uh, that's yeah, very nice of you to say um, I, it's funny I, I love being able to use the remote head but I also love being connected to the camera you know physically as well so it's it's interesting to have to have both options, uh, to use them when, you, you know, you see fit. Uh, but, uh, you know, I kind of fell in love with camera operating from the kind of the physical demands of it and being connected to the camera and learning on a fluid head at first and just loving how that, you know, translates uh, how you move your body and then how the, how the image looks. So it's, it's nice to be able to do both. Do you foresee in this new normal pandemic world, do you, do you foresee using the remote head a lot more often in the future? I guess so. I mean, I'm hearing from a movie that I started here in New York, like uh, we were a couple of weeks in, then we shut down. I'm already hearing that, you know, I, th I think they want to try and, and use the remote head more. And, you know, obviously there's, um, you probably only uh, are playing it, you know, more safe in that situation. Um, you know, I would still love to be able to choose which tool and which head to use based on the shot. But, you know, there's some other things to consider now. So if the remote head is more of a thing, then, then so be it. But there's certainly shots like I would never really do on a remote head or, or on wheels even if I could avoid it, because I'm just so comfortable uh, with a fluid head for some things and I just, I don't have to think about it as much. So it'll be interesting to see going forward, but that'll certainly be, I think, a new presence, right? You know, and, and I'm, I think the local, you know, company here at Monster Remotes is already totally zoinked out in terms of the, you know, the amount of demand that they uh, have had for remote heads. So it'll be interesting to see who gets them. And, you know, there's not an unlimited amount, I guess, to go around, but that is a new thing moving forward, I agree. So Jason, let, let's face it, you of all people, I mean, everything, all the light coming into the camera is dependent on you making sure it's in focus. So there's a lot riding on you. So, so talk to us about one of the hardest shots that you had to pull off in the film. Uh, I don't know that it's like so much the hardest shot as more, <clears throat> uh, I guess, was, well, a diet came over to my house before this whole thing started. And he was like, oh, man, this is, uh, is going to be hard for you. And I was like, okay, whatever, cool. And, like, didn't really think about it. But, I mean, the movie's a lot of wonners. So, um, I, I guess we can say that. Um, or there are some. And so it's like, you know, Mike's doing his thing. It's a dance. So it's not just me. Um, 
uh, but I definitely don't want to fuck up everybody's work. Um, uh, <laughs> so there's some some pressure with that. Uh, but that's that's part of the game, you know. It's it's why you enjoy what you do, um, and it makes it fun. Uh, but no, it was definitely difficult. But it's just about getting used to the repetition more than anything else. Because you can do it's not you. It's never about doing it once. Like you have to do that. I don't know. Like the there's one mirror sequence in there with the little girl where she comes in and like. I don't know, we must have done that thing like 17 times, like literally did it 17 times. And so it's not up to you to decide which one they're gonna use. You just have to be on for all 17 of them. Yeah, and if somebody's gonna be leaning in on one take and you're like, wait, I wasn't expecting that. <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah, no, that's really the thing is like tonight, it's, it's right, it's a weird dance of you wanna get into a rhythm, but at the same time be ready to not be in that rhythm or, uh, you know, a lot of the times like, you can expect it. Like it's a natural thing where they're going to over lean. Like if, you know, where they're, Oh, he's really, he's really getting it. Oh, he's warming up right now. Oh yeah. All right. So now he's giving it that sauce. So be ready. Cause you know, anything can happen right now. I'm jumping in. Cause I have a question regarding visual effects and working with a visual effects team. So obviously from the trailer, cause I, I don't want to give anything away, but you can see that you can't see the candy man in a lot of uh, in scenes, like in the bathroom scene. Um, so how do you, from different aspects, from focus pulling and operating with uh, somebody that's not there to just planning, John, with the visual effects team, if you guys want to talk about working with them? Yeah, I mean, I, like the uh, James McQuaid, who was the visual effects supervisor, did like amazing work and was very collaborative and really you know he had been on the movie before me and and really was helpful in like catching me up and 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 you know and collaborating you know so i think everything's different every shot's different but um uh you know it is about it's really about paying attention to that voice because he's the expert and like we all need to know like what do you need to do the thing that you have to do i think that's in general for me like working on like more visual effects heavy things it's like you just have to like you know you have to listen to everybody you have to know what they're going to need to do the shot and even if that seems like insane at the moment like you know they you know they they know and sometimes there's like backup options that you have to do and you take the time to get it because you need them to have the the all of the elements that they need in order to create the thing that they have to do their job like I, we tend to think of it as like they're and they are in a sense like creating something out of nothing um, you know, it's magic, but it's, you know, the, a lot goes into that. A lot of planning goes into that. And a lot of like people work on that for a long time and we can make one little change on set that can save them 30 hours of work later when we spend five minutes doing it on set, then we better do that thing so that they don't have to spend that 30 hours trying to fix it later. Um, yeah. So, but I think it's always, uh, uh, you know, everybody's gotta be on the same page or else you're not gonna have what you need. I, I think that's where the previs really came in uh, that we spoke mm -hmm. of earlier, um, yeah. and, you know, Nia having done her homework, shall we say, and just being fucking prepared. So when you have all that, it's like, so am I on the mirror here? Like, no, stop, like, you know, a lot of times instinctually, I would wanna be on the person because they're like, that's number two or number one, like looking at the camera and they're like, no, you need to be in the mirror right now. And they're like, oh, all right, fine. It looks weird to me, but you know what you're doing. So <laughs> going back to the mirror, sorry about that. Was there a lot of green on set, like green screen or people wearing green or anything like that? Uh, yes. Um, not like, the, I mean, you know, the, a lot of times you'll, you'll have to, you know, put a green screen up somewhere because something's going to be done there. You need to separate the actor from the background, you know, um, a lot of it is just, you know, shooting elements for things. Uh, and sometimes that happens on set. Sometimes that happens on a green screen unit. Sometimes, uh, you know, sometimes it's, uh, well, we can't, like, in this situation, we can't really use a green because it's going to spill all over the place or it's going to, 
like it's going to affect the lighting or whatever and then they come up with an alternate way of doing whatever they need to do and you know maybe it in, involves roto or maybe it involves you know there's you know you sort of they they you know that's they'll sort of figure out what method uh is going to be best for the particular shot always um, and sometimes, like I said before, it's two methods. Sometimes you're like, well, let's do this this way and we'll also give you this just in case that's going to work better for you later. That's pretty normal practice. And John and Adai, why don't you guys, I mean, there's a lot of night exterior, at least in the trailer. I assume there's a lot of night scenes in the movie as well. Talk to us about your philosophy on street lighting. Um, we it it was a it was really interesting process like for the most part we ended up using a lot of practical lights for uh for our nighttime stuff like i like i said when we walked into cabrini and we actually just saw how cabrini looked we we kind of figured out like we didn't want to do like the, the traditional like bfl on a uh on a condor far like we just ended up using a lot of practicals placed in a in a really interesting way, and like we like my rating department and my rating gaffer, like they 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 earn their fucking money on this. Like like almost any practical that you saw that you saw in the movie was something that you could dim or turn off or that was installed, and it was amazing. Like. But there was no point in time, like when we did a night exterior, that we had a condor doing a traditional backlight, oh, wow. which was so weird. But it made so much sense for the movie. It also, I think that came out of the idea of like wanting to see 360 in some places too. Where yeah, it did. It like, yeah, it did. You know, we know that we're going to see everywhere here, you know, maybe in multiple shots and, you know, occasionally all in the same shot. Um, and the best way to do that is to have all your lighting integrated into the scene so that it, you know, it, so you can see the, the lights. Um, and I think, you know, in some cases, visual effects may have helped us out there too with certain things, you know, when you know you're going to see something and they'll paint them out just like they yeah. paint out. Like. Um, and, uh, and then we also, I won't, I won't get too intellectual about it, but the other philosophy on street lighting that I'll add to that is that we definitely had a, an idea of like different colors for different places. Like, yep. because it's funny, like street lighting is such a like, like, uh, you know, most places have like replaced their street lights now, you know, they used to all be the, especially Chicago, Chicago had like a really particular like amber street light forever that was so Chicago. Um, and now, um, you know, I, I could talk about this for hours, but they like the, the, um, uh, the replacing things with more efficient LEDs, like there are many different colors of street lights now, not many that try to match the old like amber color. Um, and there's a lot of like bureaucracy in a place like Chicago, like, and, you know, politics of what street lights go where and like, it's, you know, and we wanted to use that. I think we talked about this early on about like, you yeah. know, like let's let's give different neighborhoods different feels based on the street lighting, and I don't you know whether like you know that's an intellectual idea or not, but like hopefully it's something that you feel in the image somehow. Yeah. And what ISO did you? Sorry, what ISO did you guys use? I think we were sixteen hundred most of the time. Is that yeah. correct? Yeah, sixteen hundred yeah. most of the time. Interior. Uh, interior. What's that? interior and exterior at 1600? Yeah, I think we sort of went down the middle. I sort of like go back and forth on my ideas on ISO with these digital cameras. Like, um, you know, I always shoot uh, day exteriors at high ISOs, um, which is a whole conversation that I'm not, I wouldn't, I won't like get into at the moment, but, um, uh, and, um, and often use, you know, 800 or 600 for, uh, or sorry, 800 or 1600 for darker scenes to preserve the shadows. Um, 
uh, 800 would do a better job. I think in this case, I think we went to, we did 1600 because it's sort of like, I mean, like the, the, the movie that Mike and I did, American Pickle, we shot the whole movie at 3200, um, which, was a, which was an aesthetic choice. Like we wanted a little texture out of it. And, you know, and that's a, there's a, a whole like animal to lighting at that ISO. I think 1600 here was more about like, you know, if we are going to use all these practicals, like it gives us that little extra, you know, <clears throat> bump so that we don't have to shoot everything wide open. Um, and, you know, like I, I do like the, I like shallow depth of field as a tool. I don't like shallow depth of field all the time. Um, and it's nice to be able to have, uh, you know, another great thing about using the large format with the, you can use wider lenses closer up. You can use wider lenses for things that you wouldn't normally, but you can also control the depth of field of that so that you can have a shallower depth of field on a wide lens or you can have deep focus too, which I think a lot of this movie, there's a lot of deep focus as well. You guys had mentioned that your day zero, some of the shots in there were the hardest in the film. So for people that aren't too familiar, if somebody could mention what day zero means and then talk about some, why some of those were the, some of the hardest shots. Yeah, I mean, day zero is a concept that uh, I think has been invented by productions now, like when they have like something that they think they can shoot before the first day of shooting usually, uh, you know, cutting into the prep time of, uh, of everybody or, or before things are fully prepped. Um, in this case, uh, uh, our, we, we only did a couple shots on our day zero, um, but one of them, I, I'm not gonna say where we shot, I'm not gonna say what we did, it's not something that we are tied, but one of them was a very complicated Zoom shot um, and I really threw Jason into the fire on it. Um, and uh, uh, so it was a very hard shot, but he nailed it and it's beautiful and it, I love it in the movie and, uh, you know, but it's a, it's a, it's a, you know, good way to get acquainted. <laughs> <laughs> Kudos to Jason for pulling it off. <laughs> So you had mentioned also that Nia was pretty, um, she was a lot of times found in the DIT tent with you. For people that aren't familiar with the DIT, maybe explain what the DIT is and what they did on, on set. And then how was it working with Nia so closely in that? Uh, yeah, great. I mean, uh, DIT, uh, um, digital image technician uh, is, uh, you know, person who is, you know, your camera tech on set, your image tech on set, your on set colorist, like you're like eagle eye, like for focus and, you know, like things in the shot that shouldn't be there. He has, uh, he or she has the biggest um, monitor on set. In this case, it was James Natari. Uh, and, um, you know, early on, like just when Nia and I were talking about like how, like what's what's our process going to be on set, like we sort of decided that, you know, we would both spend our time when we can watching the shots from the DIT tent, which, I mean, I there are, as these guys will probably tell you more of, there are, you know, different approaches to, uh, like from DPs, like some of them spend most of their time with the director, some of them spend most of their time in the DIT tent um, because it is the best monitor. I sort of go back and forth depending on the project I'm doing. Like if it's a real like technical, like, you know, uh, project, like I, I will spend most of my time with the DIT looking at the, the larger monitor. Usually, unfortunately, that means that you are not with the director. Um, and there's really a benefit to like, like, being right next to the director all the time and being able to like judge their reaction to everything that's going on, whether it be photographic or performance. Um, and, uh, you know, in this case, it was like the best of both worlds where like, like I got to be 
in the DIT tent with the DIT, looking at all the technical aspects of things, but also having the director there. Um, and I think it was nice for her because she like, you know, it's, it's like the best way to experience the movie on set and you're not like distracted by everything else that's around you. You really, it's the DIT always sets up the best um, viewing experience. So <clears throat> it was a unique thing and I really um, would urge other directors to, you know, when it's possible, I would like to I would like to do it that way. I know it's totally like in like the world of COVID on set now, you know, I'm not gonna be in a tent with anybody probably. We're all gonna end up like, you know, either separated by plexiglass or in our own on our own monitors. So uh, who knows what the future holds. Speaking of, how do you feel this film would have been done differently if you were to do it in the pandemic? Because you were in very tight spaces. How would, how would you have each done your jobs in this new normal in that regard? Maybe we'll start with Ade. Um, honestly enough, um, it would have, for me, it would have been about the same. Like uh, the biggest change, like, with the with the new normal like other than just like wear a mask and stuff it's just like like now it's more expected like if you're on a show right now you're gonna be getting tested like three times a week and once you actually get to work like um the actual work for the lighting department it it, it really it, it it hasn't changed that much like i think the only difference for me is like i don't spend as much time in the DIT tent, like I have to just like duck my head in, really assess everything that's going on and then like get out of there. So like it, it doesn't, it, it hasn't really changed that much for me. Like, like the, like the on, only thing that's changed for me is just like logistics and like hiring personnel and like making sure people get tested before we, um, before we even, they even get to set. But other than like the actual process of lighting hasn't really changed that much. What about you, Mike? as you've now or are will be doing a project pretty soon in Oklahoma, how is it affecting you? Uh, well, yeah, just like I said, it's the pre pre-production for everybody that's, you know, COVID related and COVID trainings and all that. And it's all very necessary and important. I think when it comes down to it, you know, it, similar to a diet, it's like, yeah, you, I'll be wearing more PPE obviously than I ever have uh, before, but you know, it's basically, uh, I think some decisions, you know, location-based have been made prior to me showing up on set and whatever people think is safe and right for the amount of crew and talent that they want to bring in. So I'm just going to go where people want the camera to go and then there'll be a COVID compliance officer probably, you know, maybe keeping, well, definitely keeping an eye on me. And then, you know, again, I just pan tilt and get out of there. You know, I don't want to receive COVID and I don't want to give it to anybody either. So it's just best if I pan tilt and then go for the door. And I think that's what people are gonna to wanna to see for me, even now more than ever. Uh, so as to have less bodies breathing in the same air, but we'll see, it'll be interesting. Uh, but that's my that's my guess is how it'll be. I go where the camera goes and I have a message. I'm surprised that wasn't your bio, Pooks. I just pan tilt and I go for the door. Yeah, well, yeah, it's a good idea for the next, you know, it's my first Zoom panel. Um, the, you know, for the next one, if there is one, I will change my bio to that. Pan, tilt, door, exit. Jason, what about you? Uh, I don't know that it'll be that much different, like they said, in the PPE. Um, you know, uh, sadly, I probably won't be able to share uh, tight spaces with the script supervisor and the director anymore. Um, but, uh, you know, stay away from everyone. And I mean, let's be honest, I mean, pulling remotely nowadays like we we try to stay away from everyone as much as possible anyway so like i honestly don't think it'll be that different for me um i try to stay out of the way because to give other people room to work so uh i think it'll be about the same for me except I don't design my mask and i don't like that yeah they're gonna be bland and ugly <laughs> oh there there has been one very very small change um i can't it's harder to do like last minute tweaks. Like it doesn't happen as much. Mm -hmm. Like um, if you had like once a, once you do like in it, and like lighting people with their mask on and like, because the stand is to have their mask on and stuff like that, 
that shit gets really, really difficult. It is what it is, but like it, it gets really difficult. And like you don't like it's not really cool to try and say like, oh, we're shooting in the car. I have a tube that's rigged up in the car. The actor's right there. No one's really cool about saying like, oh, let me just have my guy just dive in or one of my electricians just dive in right next to the actor and try and tweak something like it it becomes more like respect the process like all right we got to tweak something okay have the actor step out of the car real quick let let me do my tweak and they come back in and hopefully it kind of lands in the right spot like there's been a few times where like i can like somebody could just stick their hand in and not really be in the car and kind of do whatever but like like really like there's not there's not going to be a lot of times where you're like right next to the actor in a really really tight spot trying to tweak something that does that that will not be happening so it sounds like there's going to be a lot more time taken on set to do most of what you could do in a very fast fashion but yeah you're gonna it, need it, more I don't, like it, it's it sucks in a way but like it's kind of like it it's kind of cool to sometimes have to like you have people have to say like, oh, I have to respect the process and it has to be done in a certain way. Like, like I'm not gonna lie, like it, like I, I, I enjoy being able to do the last minute tweaks, but I really enjoy people like having to respect the process of making a, making a movie. Mm -hmm. So John, talk to us, I mean, now that we're coming to the end of this, talk to us about the finishing process. How's it been coloring the film? Uh, it's it's been great. Um, we I uh, luckily got to work with uh, Natasha Leonette at um, eFilm, um, and uh, you know I've, we've worked together several times, and uh, it was an interesting process because I couldn't be there as often because it really like a lot of it happened you know this movie was supposed to come out in june originally <clears throat> um and now october but so we were sort of early on um working on uh color when clients weren't allowed in the suites at the time so luckily natasha was part of pre-production with us we you know I shared some lookbooks with her uh, she helped us create the LUT for the movie we talked a lot <clears throat> about how we wanted the movie to look so you know there was some abstract process to doing color because you know we were talking about it but I wasn't seeing anything um, there was a period of time where Nia could see things on an iPad. Uh, she was in New York and Natasha was here in LA and they have a system where, you know, they can color live and you can see it on an iPad, but which isn't the same. It's a closer experience than watching it on your television probably, um, but it's not the same as sitting there in a, with a you know, projector and, you know, grading for the big screen. Um, and then at some point I was able to go in and, you know, watch an entire uh, pass of the movie and make notes and so was Nia and, uh, and so were the producers and uh, visual and James McQuaid um, was able to go as well. And, uh, um, uh yeah so it was you know it was a different process it, luckily it could have been a nightmare if it had been with a colorist that i had never worked with before um but uh it you know really happy with what we ended up doing and luckily you know um we have you know the the in my opinion the best colorist there is working on the movie so all right, my last question, horror movie, it's very serious. The trailer is obviously very serious, but what was the funniest thing that happened on set? What was the funniest thing that happened during, throughout the shooting? I'm not sure I understand. Hmm? Here he's trying to answer that question, it sounds like. <laughs> um, 
I won't throw the assistant under the bus, but uh, <laughs> we were, there's uh, and, and Michael's favorite shot. Uh, we we're on the river, and I just remember looking at the dolly, and I could hear someone playing with the head, and I looking in the water, and I was like, "What just hit the concrete? Was that a, was that a tie down?" So <laughs> Michael Phelps, the tie down was born that day. <laughs> All right. Well, well thank you all. Thank you all for this awesome conversation and really excited to actually see the movie. And then maybe we can chat more after that to once you can reveal <laughs> things behind uh, what we get to see. So um, as John said, that the movie does come out in October, October 16th. Hopefully um, that means it's coming out in theaters. Uh, we'll see how things progress. Um, and in, as far as Filmscape goes, there's another class today in about an hour, uh, TM30 Essentials, sponsored by ETC, a lighting class. And then all weekend long, we have lighting, makeup, camera, sound, post-production classes, um, and it's all free. And if you sign up for this, you can easily just jump in on any of those. So thank you all for joining us and thank you guys for uh, being part of this conversation. It's good to see your faces remotely. Thank you yeah, guys, you this all. was great. Yeah, this was awesome. I, uh, I'll see y'all later. I really have to go to sleep. To sleep. <laughs> <laughs> it was only bye. for everybody, take care. All right, bye guys. Bye, thank you.